Hey everyone, oh. we're not live. Are we? <laughs> no. We are we live. Oh, good. Shit. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Oh, Rob. To the stream. Fabulous. This is great. Okay. And I'll just set this to full screen, and we are ready to go. Alrighty. So this is it. Second stream. We're gonna put a link up. Uh. What? Hello. Are we, are we, Hi. Does, does that mean we're all... Hello. Hello. Excellent. What? Is that for real? There's apparently 125 people viewing. That can't be real, right? That's definitely uh, not real. We're 16 viewers at the moment. That right. makes more sense. Okay, say. great. <sighs> Alrighty. Cool. So, um, the Mixing Desk, thank you very much everyone for, for tuning in and um, thank you to all of our panellists to for, for coming on again. Um, good, did we want to just quickly go around and um, introduce ourselves very, very briefly? Yeah, okay, well, I'll go first. My name is Desney. Uh, I am a LARP right, uh, the writer and director of The Hobbit's Hoedown. I've been doing LARP for about five years or so, give or take. Um, and, yeah, I, I started this little stream so that we could escape from the madness that is isolation and still be creative and collaborative within the realms of LARP. Yeah, uh, I can go next. Um, I am Hayden, also a uh, an organizer and uh, a contributor to the Hobbit's Hoedown. Uh, I've also been LARPing for nine years now, uh, and craft has sort of become, you know, probably my my biggest skill off the the creating and organizing side. Um, so yeah. Keen to be here. Hi, I'm Joe. I've been LARPing for 22 years. I've helped run games for lots and lots of different organisations and lots of different groups. Um, I was the director for Watchers of East Haven, and I am happy to be here and talk about stuff. Mixing Desk is awesome. me or you rob which one uh you're to my left on the screen so you're up oh okay hi um i'm mads i've been larping for about 10 years and i'm the uh community engagement person for swordcraft which is melbourne's biggest battle larp and yeah i do lots of larp stuff that's me Hey everyone, I'm Rob. Uh, I've been LARPing since 2003. Um, I am the lead writer of Black Powder and Bloodlines, and I also used to run Zeppelin Games, a steampunk club. That was a real cool. good game, Zeppelin. Yeah, I hear someone else who was on this panel was also involved in that. <laughs> it's only rumour, though. Weird. Oh, yeah. What a weird rumor. <laughs> I know. Right? Star thing to say. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, alrighty. So I guess let's start with the what what is uh, a mixing desk? Does anyone want to put their hand up for um maybe giving us a short tidbit on on what it is? Yeah, sure. So we uh, this is a series about writing and designing LARPs. And when you're writing and designing LARPs, you want to be really thoughtful about everything you do. And that means that you're choosing what sort of levels of things you're putting into your game. And so some Nordic LARP theorists came up with a concept called the Mixing Desk of LARP. Um, can we get it up? That's all right. Uh not on my end, unfortunately. That's all right. I'll do it. Here we go. Check this out. Boom. This is the mixing desk of LARP straight from Wikipedia. 
Um, and the idea is that just like a mixing desk that a sound designer might use, you have all of these objects, all of these um, concepts, and you pick where your LARP sits on all of these sort of spectrum between, uh, you know, if you're going between immersion to imagination, you're, are you like completely transparent? Does everyone know everything or you, have you, has everyone got secrets? Um, and the idea is that really, even if you don't quite fit exactly where you want to be, you have deliberately and mindfully made a choice about each of these things. And when you begin to stray from that, you can, as a group, as an organizing group, you can have a discussion about it. You can go, well, you know, this new thing we want to put in is really cool, but we said we wanted to be super immersive. So does this fit that? And so forth. So that's generally what the mixing desk is. Yeah, and I think it's also useful to note as well that nearly every aspect of a LARP um, is designable with the mixing desk. Um, so that means the lead up to your event, and that also means um, the aftermath of, of your event as well. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a useful tool to sort of guide your, like, your team so that you all have this, like, I guess it helps you to like also build like a glossary of terms with each other as well so that you're all on the same page and understanding uh, where you're at in terms of um, what is part of your LARP or what isn't a part of your LARP. And it, and it is just an, a really good indicator of the, the questions that you really need to ask yourself when you are designing um, an immersive or um uh, like a, a role play game experience like LARPing. Does anyone else have any? No, good work, guys. Stream over. Hold on. Yep. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, so, um, do do we want to go through? Um, I, I guess what it what it does for 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 games in general, or do you think we've covered it? No, look, um, uh, mainly being facetious there, but like that that initial concept, of, of course, of acknowledging that, A, when you're designing a LARP, design all of it. Um, there's like a dozen faders on the mixing desk, but that, that, that it's what's really important is to use it as a conceptual tool to understand that everything that you do as a LARP designer is an act of design and it should be a conscious act of design rather than just going well this is what we think so we'll we'll row with it we we had this idea in the design process and we like it so we keep it it's important that you figure out where it fits in with your conceptual framework and what your goals are and what your material endpoints are thank you hayden um uh, and then using the mixing desk fader settings, you can then go forward and making later design or operational decisions refer back to it. Um, and that's sort of the, the crux of why it's useful, not so much to set it and forget it, but to use it as an ongoing developmental tool and an ongoing operational tool um, for your game. So we could go through the individual faders if people wanted to uh, on the concept, but um, I feel it might be useful to also discuss the, the processes for making those decisions uh, and ways of taking note of them later uh, as well. Yeah. What do people think about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, for sure. Well, I was, yeah, because I was going to say, like, I've sort of, and I think Joe and Rob probably have the most experience using, like, utilizing the, the mixing desk, because um, I know, like, I have used it sort of once or twice um, in LARP planning. And for me, I think the greatest value it had sort of rather than being like, you know, this is where we want to be, this is what we're aiming for, is more that it's a good lens or framework through which to view design because um, it helps you sort of... Uh, helps you look at each decision and design element in the way like it helps you look at each uh 
yeah, decision and design element you're going to make and how it will potentially impact the game and what uh, what it will do to the play experience. And I think that's a good way. Like, even if you're not otherwise taking it that seriously, getting into that sort of mindset is a good thing that it helps you do. Um, so, yeah, I think there's value to be had in it, even if you're like, ah, these spectra are ridiculous. Like, what do you mean there's an option for uh, game mechanics? There should only be game mechanics. Um, and there should be calls and numbers and uh, pips. Like, wh why is there a fader for that? Like, the, the point being, yeah, there's a fader for that. Um, I think as well it's also useful to um, say that there are going to be some default positions in your mixing desk. Uh just maybe from sheer fact that you, uh, maybe your venue um, that is available to you isn't going to be um, as immersive or maybe your budget's a little bit constricting or, you know, just things like that that are kind of out of your control but that you can still consider when you are making the mixing desk and how to design around it. But absolutely, almost every surface in in the game can be designed very purposefully so um i guess uh we've got a question that was how can you share some stories in which it saved the day for you as creators rob did you want to go first yeah sure i mean um it kind of saves the day all the time um, because what the Black Powder, the, the Immersive Arts organizing team, did right at the start of the Black Powder campaign was sit down and go through the, the mixing disc concepts and essentially all of the concepts that we wanted to look at and go, okay, so where on this spectrum does, it lie? does this lie? What are the two ends of the spectrum if, if it wasn't something that was already on the desk? Um, and then where do we want to sit? So we thought, okay, well... How exploratory do we want this game to be? Um, how how physically adventurous is? Is it a game where people go on a, a long walk, a hike through a bushland area, um, and they meet uh, encounters that we've pre-written along the way, and we, we call that a linear event in in a local scene, um, or is it going to be a more freeform event where? we sort of have a vague script and events that we can throw at the players at any given time. Um, and w which, where between these two points do we want our game to be? Um, and so we made the decision that we wanted it to start, um, you know, pretty close to the linear end and then gradually scale down to, towards the freeform end as the game went on and players had more agency. Just to, out of that example, it meant that later down the track, we can go, okay, well, all of us, are, we know that all of us are on the same page conceptually when it comes to what we want to do with this. So, uh, A, it saves us time talking about later decisions because we don't have to have that discussion over again. But also it means that when we're stuck, we go, okay, well, Let's refer back to our faders. Let's refer back to our missing, mixing desk. What are the decisions that we made, um, you know, back when we started writing the game? Um, a, you know, have we changed our minds? Probably not. We've still got this conceptual framework that we want to work with. So what decisions can we make that'll refer back to that and reinforce those ideas that we want to do? So, you know, when we think, hmm, do we want to have uh, adventures where, like, um, people are wandering through the bush on a set path and fighting monsters, we go, well, that doesn't really match with our, our faders, um, so let's not do that. Yeah, I've got another, an example that's almost a counterexample where we weren't using it for Watchers of East Haven and should have been. So there was... Um, a couple of plot lines where Watchers was supposed to be and advertised itself as a very low pressure game for the players. Um, it was supposed to be a game where players could go and be escapist, very escapist, very, very airy, you know, go out and have fun. Um, and we ran a couple of plot lines that put fairly serious pressure on the players in terms of making moral, difficult moral decisions. And I think that if I had my time over, I would be looking at where our, 
like I would have had the slider discussion at the start, but then be looking at that slider and say, well, does this plot line fit that slider? You know, are we putting too much pressure here? Um, is this raising issues that are too close to home for our players? And if so, maybe we should run a different plot. Madeline, did you have any um, stories of, of um, your mixing desks, um, either adventures or misadventures? Um, I guess the first time I used this concept was probably about a year ago when uh, Swordcraft changed its setting and my warband decided to throw our whole 14th century English royalty warband in the trash and start something different. Um, and at that point, it wasn't just me creating this setting for my 15 players. It was becoming more of a collaboration between all the players who were in my warband. And I wasn't really comfortable kind of looking at it and choosing where the sliders were myself necessarily, because it was also a matter. And I mean, you can't do this when you're designing a game very often, but it was also a matter of balancing the personal preferences of each and every person in my warband and what they wanted. So I basically put together a survey um, that had all of that in it and said, which do you prefer? You know, do you want there to be lots of secrets or do you want to be very open? Do you want me to create an open world for you? Or do you want to discover things as we go? Like what, what do you want? Um, and it helped us put together something uh, that actually looking back a year later, I wasn't entirely happy with because it ended up being kind of designed by committee, uh, which anyone who works in design knows that design by committee doesn't really work. Like we were very happy with it. I love what we ended up coming up with, but letting too many people have input into where the sliders should be actually ended up kind of sending it slightly awry opposed to if I, as the LARP right, had decided where they were going to be myself as a designer, designing a whole inclusive experience. Um, so I guess I just throw that out there as, an, as another example of how it, yes, it works and it works well if you have a small design team and like, you know, you're making those conscientious decisions about every single aspect of design. But if you're trying to do it by committee, it doesn't work. I would not recommend. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, for, for us at the Hobbit's Hoedown, uh, obviously I was the writer and director, um, but from, because of the nature in which it came about um, and the way that I wrote it, or um, it was just I had kind of put together a very, very large chunk of it. Like it was already such a huge, like a lot of the work had already been, I'd already done um, because I expected to do it by myself. Um, Cause I didn't know that anyone else would be interested in, in helping me out. But as it turned out, um, people did send me messages and, you know, said that they did want to come on board and, and start to help me. And one of the first things that I did um, for the first ever meeting, because there were so many different visions that other organizers had, um, the way to sort of pull everyone in to being more or less on the same page was for us to just, for me to sit everyone down and say, hey, you'll, we need to, let's get this mixing desk out of the way so that we know what this thing is and what it isn't. Um, and it really helped us to understand uh, kind of more or less where we were going to be going together. Um, and because I had already done so much of the writing work, it helped me to get my organizing team more on board or understanding where it is or where it was I was trying to take us and where I envisioned that we were going. Well, it kind of becomes your internal mission statement then and like an easy visual representation of where you're supposed to be headed. Like Rob was saying how you can kind of look and you can be like, oh, is this, does this fall in line with what we want to be doing? Like, I think it works really, really well as that. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I think yeah, another sure. benefit that it carries is that it does help you um, get insight into 
where every where all the designers agree and but it also helps uh you know reveal points of difference as well which i think is important because you know if people do disagree there'll be a reason and um like even if ultimately the reason for that disagreement is something that can't be carried into the the game like there's still value to be had from teasing that out um and i think that's really useful as well yeah, and that follows on to an answer Xeniox is asking in the chat um, about how in audio engineering you have your one strong director who sets the faders and no one else is allowed to touch them. And I think that while uh, that can be true, usually, like if we take the Hobbit So Down as an example, and it's one that I don't have inside input into, but... You know, Des is the one who's got her fingers on the sliders and she's the one who touches them. But everyone on the team talks about where the sliders should be set. And if you have that discussion with your team, that gives you buy-in from your team. Like your team will discuss, you know, and they can, you also talk about, you know, a setting that is three quarters of the way towards immersion like without discussing it how do you know what that actually means you actually need to discuss it with your team to decide you know there's no it's not like a volume an actual volume fader which will you know it's very clear where things are um it's more it's it's much more art and open-ended it's a lot more difficult to actually just draw a line and say this is where it is um so, no, I think that it's actually really important to have your whole team involved in where the faders are set, even if you do have one person who says, who is the person who has the final say and who actually, you know, quote unquote, moves the faders, but doesn't. But I, I do think that you need to collaborate on where those faders should be set, and you definitely need to collaborate on what the setting actually means. Mm. I might um, chip in there as well and give a, a, a slightly different answer to Xeniox. Uh, and my answer is, in fact, that um, the number of people who have creative control to the level that we're talking about in terms of, um, you know, the, the basic fundamental settings of the game that the team is going to run, that's the first fader. So that's the discussion that you as organizers need to have internally. Um, whether that discussion consists of one person standing up the front of everyone else and saying, okay, so I'm in charge and you're all just going to do my vision. Um, and then it's up to the people involved to decide whether they want to do that or not. Or if it's, you know, four people sitting at Joe's kitchen table over um, pie press pies and saying, okay, together we all want to have this kind of goal with this kind of aim and we want this level of immersion and this level of this and this and this, that first concept about how your team is actually going to work is one of the most discussions that you'll once most important discussions that you'll have because if two people on the team think that it's a dictatorship and two people on the team think it's a democracy then the first argument you have you're going to have some really serious problems so it's very important um, from a design perspective that you have those discussions but also that you have the discussions like all that all of the faders be discussed in the appropriate manner for your organization depending on scale and work ethic and um belief systems and all that sort of thing so Great. while it while it can be a problem if we've got a design guy committee situation you it can also be a problem if there's one director and actually everyone disagrees with their vision indeed um that being said, I say let's move on to the actual faders. Um, so the first one I'm going to bring up is openness. Um, this is transparency versus secrecy. So it's um, info about your game. So it can be character descriptions or events that are going to happen. Um, it can be basically what your maybe you your players know or what characters know. Um, and it can be great for drama. Transparency can be great for drama, but it, it can also be, it can also mean that there's no surprises for, for your players. Um, 
does anyone want to pitch in to uh, add anything on? I mean, I think this is actually something that, like, a lot of a lot of LARPs are built around this sort of, you know, sort of a lot of the underlying tension of the, the sort of the way the LARP is built is around what information is available to the players. Um, and, you know, I think there are also other things that play in, but like, yeah, that, that sort of sense of how much information do the players have? How much information do their characters have? Is there a delineation between those two things? Um, you know, is surprise a part of the game that you want, even if it's like a pleasant, fun surprise or like a spooky surprise? Um, and yeah, this sort of also touches on the sort of trust thing that came up last time is, you know, uh, if you set your openness at a certain level and then don't follow through on that, um, you know, sort of the amount that you trust your players slash the players trust the organizers can play into how this this slider um, works in practice. Uh, so I think this is actually really one of the really important ones that I think um, should be focused on because, yeah, I think this is one where it does matter a lot what setting you have it at because it will affect your game in pretty significant ways. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think that a it should be noted that even when the organizers set it to a particular level, that doesn't necessarily mean that's where the players are playing at. So if we look at Black Powder and Bloodlines is a very it's not a transparent game, right? There are plots and schemes and things behind the background. There is a lot that the players have to find out in game as characters. Um, there's also quite a bit that they tell us what the drama is going to be and then we go and play it. But it's, it's not a particularly transparent game. But I've been part of plots at that game where a player has come to me as a player and said, hey, you know, I want to run this plot with the orcs, so I'm going to come down and try and trick you into this stuff and I want this sort of thing to happen. Um, and then we either follow along with and then we we play that out both players knowing what's really going on behind the scenes but the characters not and so your players even though you're organizing line might be set somewhere your players might not play that way um and i think that's basically fine when your players push towards transparency but if you're playing a fully transparent game and your players have secrets that come into the game, that can wreck your game. So you need to be very aware of that. Yeah, the scale of openness and transparency basically goes from chess to poker, right? Um, and if you're playing, ch if you're playing chess and you hover your hand over the board and people can't see where your rook is, that's cheating. Um, but if you're playing poker and you put your hand down on the table, all right, that's a weird way to play, but there's no rule against it, I guess. So it's important, like, in terms of player agency that that, that be done. Um, it's also important when you're making that setting to understand what kind of effect it will have on the game. Um, as a, I think Joe said, the, no, as Hayden said, the uh, opportunities for surprise start to go down in a transparent game. Um, although, of course, it's possible for anyone to surprise anyone, um, such as players. Players are very surprising people. Um, but the secrecy increases competition and potentially uh, viciousness of competition. So if you're wanting to play, uh, if you're wanting to run uh, a softer, gentler game, often leaning towards the transparent side of things is good and saying, okay, well, here is all of the information, go, um, and seeing what happens. Or if you're wanting to play with consent-based mechanics um, uh, rather than uh, rules, rules or uh, competitive-based mechanics, they can be useful. So it's important to have an idea of what each end of the scale will look like and then what that will do to the play experience. Yeah, and it depends on your players as well, because I mean, in my experience, um, more experienced players are more likely to tell all of their secrets 
spread anything they know out into the open um, and basically play that game. Whereas new players, I find, will hold on to stuff much tighter and are a bit more tentative to give that away. And of course, like, you know, there's outliers either way. But I know when I started playing, I would always want to hold on to secrets. And like, I took a lot of the secrets to my character's death, basically, because uh, I never told anyone. And looking back, and then the next time I played a game, I was like, okay, I'm going to take like my 10 deepest secrets. I'm going to tell my 10 closest friends, which is like half the game. So everyone knows about all this either horrible stuff I've done or my weaknesses and that kind of stuff. And I mean, if you know you're going to be playing a game with a lot of experienced people, I think that you can. Yeah, it just it just depends to who your players are. Yeah, one of my um, some of my greatest experiences have been uh, at um, the Legends of the Five Legend of the Five Rings LARP, where on the first day of the first game that anyone was running, um, I was looking over my character briefing and it said, "Okay, go and." fuck with the lion and i looked over at the group of people who were playing lion clan and i saw gareth and joe look up and stare at me and i went ah oh, so your briefing says go fuck with the phoenix clan all right it's on um and that was the source of some really entertaining in character competition and because we both knew because uh, we all knew um uh, you know what the the groundwork for that was it was it was good times and not knowing that each of us were against each other would have made that really weird yeah and i think that following on from that example like one of the best stories in that one was fights where uh, you and gareth agreed who was going to win the fight and then went and had a fight right and that was like the the event that that happened at was actually you know a glorious story and that can happen with the the open play um and again that's another example of one where the organizers wrote a game full of secrets and the players played an open game because they were old experienced players like mads is talking about um yeah. Do we want to move on to the next slider? Or have we got more to say on openness? No, I, th I think um, we're pretty good. Uh, I've got here that um, the next one is scenography. Um, so it's the difference between the 360 illusion versus minimalism. Um, so this is basically uh, just how much of your surroundings are as immersive as possible or are as... Um, are, are basically up to imagination um, as as much as as much as possible. Um, those are the two extremes, and then you can have obviously because we're working on these faders something that's on that spectrum. Um, and a lot of the time, this is down to the venue that you're holding it at, um, and at times even. Um, you know, uh, at, it's a constraint of of budget or or lo yeah, your general location. Um, so this can be a harder thing to nail, but it but it can be something that you decide to like. A, it's like you set up your um, have set dressing, uh, or that you as much as possible try and find and scout for a location that is going to be as suitable as possible for to have as um, high as impact visually as much as possible. That includes all your props and the things that your players will bring to the game as well. Does anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, my favourite example of this slider is actually Swordcraft because their Friday night has it nearly all the way to symbolism, right? Where basically everyone, I mean, the players all dress up very nicely and have good gear, but the prop, is, the, the field is a sports field and the, um, you know, you have rivers that are actually just orange bollards on walls that are also orange bullets. And, and I think that works great for the Friday night game. And then they go, okay, now it's quest time. So we're going to slide the slider all the way the other way, as far as we can get it towards 360 immersion. Um, and I think it's so interesting watching people make that flip um, for different kinds of games. 
Um, I've tended to run games that were very much uh, pushing towards symbolism. I mean, we ran the with Caligo Monday, we ran a pirate game where most of the players were, you know, t-shirts and shorts, and we were playing in a scout hall. Um, Watchers of East Haven was using, um, you know, ropes for traps and um, bean bags for balls and like passages between trees as dungeons. And I think those games are great. And I think a lot of the time we fall into the trap of thinking that 360 degree illusion is inherently better just because it's more expensive um, and because it looks so fucking cool in photographs. I don't think it is necessarily better, but it depends on what game you want to run. And so you need to carefully decide what kind of game you want to run and if it's the kind of game that would benefit from doing 360 Illusion or if it's not. Yeah, for for um, for a lot of the, the time when you're thinking about, uh, I guess, uh, a lot of these mixing desk ideals or concepts, um, for me at least, what I think about when I'm designing something is like, what do I want my players to feel? And a lot of the time, for, for me personally, it's I want them to feel like I want it. I want them to feel cool. And so, <laughs> like, I I want as much as possible for for things to feel like you're in, um, a, a, like a movie or something like that. Which is why, um, for example, my my Hobbit lap, I tried to get a location that looked very hobbity um, and I, I wanted it to feel very, very homely and um, to have as much of the decorations and the props to be as homely looking as, as possible. And um, yeah, it can very, very much vary for what you're um, designing for. Something like Swordcraft, which is very like fantasy medieval, can be a little bit harder because, you know, you're not just going to happen upon a fantasy medieval town. Um, but uh, like fortunately, everyone in, in Swordcraft, the player base is very, very dedicated. They're very, very... Um, they want to invest in the complete aesthetic of the game. And that is very much encouraged by the organizers as well. They, they make that space something that the players can bring something to, which is also something that I think um, is communicated as well, very, very well by, by Soulcraft. Yeah, I think as well, I mean, for me, one of the big things about this is because uh, this is a thing that I sort of do in my normal life around sort of neural load, uh, which is this idea that um, I have a certain capacity to take in a certain amount of information at one time um, and hold other information in my head at one at a time and, you know, doing more of one lessens my capacity for the other. Um and this is due in part to some like neural brain stuff that my brain is doing. But one of the things I've noticed is that in sort of a higher immersion environment, the amount of my brain required to simulate that, uh, that environment in here is reduced and allows me to put more neural energy into other things. But of the same token, like, you know, some of the best experiences I feel like a lot of people had were sort of, doing what essentially amounts to LARP when you're a kid, like, you know, you and your friends have a bunch of sticks and you're out fighting each other or, like, things that aren't there. And that's, like, symbolism all the way up there, baby. Like, that's, you know, there is basically no fizz rep apart from, again, you're using a stick. Um, and, like, yeah, a lot of people have very fond memories doing things like that. Um, and, you know, as you get older... Uh, that gets harder and harder to do. That gets harder and harder to simulate. And I suspect it is due to that sort of neural load problem where you're taking in more of your environment and that's sort of drowning out your ability to simulate stuff in your head. But, um, like, I feel like there is, you know, if you if you don't feel like you personally as a designer or as a team of designers are capable of creating an environment where... Um, 
you can physically represent things, creating a, a mood or atmosphere that instead allows for, you know, you can, you can sort of sub props out or sub out physical representation sometimes for, um, uh, like a mood or atmosphere, which will help, uh, sort of cover that. Um, so yeah, I sort of, that's my thought on this one. Cause this is not one of those, this is not a slider where I'm like, oh, it's really important that we stick it at a specific spot. Um, yeah, I don't know. That seemed a bit rambly, but. No, no, that's a, that was good points. Like it, it isn't important where it goes, it, but it is important that it goes somewhere and that be held to. Um, uh, like at one end, uh, going back to the concrete examples, um, if for a, a pure symbolism game, you've got your con games like Joe was talking, or con or freeform games, um, where it's people in casual clothes in a scout hall or a school classroom or something, that's that's your full. It's all in here, uh, and at the other end, three sixty degree illusion. You've actually got like reenactment or um, some of the better quests, uh, where everything that you see is legitimately what should be there in the game world and it and that neural dealing with that neural load is what that helps with but also what the expectation level is is what you can then get away with too because if you go well we don't have the budget for a literal cthulhu But the game doesn't require that. The players already have a, 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 sol a solid grounding of imagination that they need to use to get through the game on a general general level. Okay, we chuck a Cthulhu in there because, you know, it's not going to do any harm to the immersion. Or um, you go, okay, well, we're going to go 360-degree immersion with every single piece of costuming, but we're going to recognize that the site we've got just can't do it. And that's okay. What? But what's important is that you make the decision and then stick to it and reinforce what you're doing and it is uh, also from for newer laugh designers i I, am, I would guess that wanting to push that higher in terms of like a, a standard raising type deal um would probably be really important from the games that you've seen around you but you've got to remember that laugh has different standards in different places someone in the chat talked about european laughs where they have access to castles uh we don't have access to castles um just like castle themed fun parks um, so it's it's okay if to acknowledge the physical and budgetary limitations uh, of what you as designers have access to. Um, and if I could give a bit of advice if for people who want to do a higher or a more 360 degree immersion level um, is that costumes can help cheat and create that uh, that immersion because the most important thing at the game is the other people rather than the physical props. So if you, chuck a bunch of people in fantastic costumes and then just turn the lights down, you'll, you'll get away with a lot more. <laughs> yeah, or, I mean, if the All most... about lighting. <laughs> no, yes. um, if the most important thing to you as a LARP game designer, if you let go, I want to run the highest immersion game I possibly can, then maybe what you should be doing is running a modern game about a bunch of people who look like us in Australia, like you need to design your game. If you want to make the most, like the highest illusion game you can, then bend the rest of your design around it. And I think the Hobbit Hoedown did a really good job of that, right? Where they were like, okay, no, we're discarding a bunch of other game design in order to get our 360 degree degree illusion we're like no this is this is where we're going to have it and we are going to do this we're not going to have any sort of you can't play humans because then it's too hard to have giant humans if we have everyone the same size that's great we all look hobbity um so i think that it's the best to sort of you can just design your game around what you want your illusion to be and what you have access to. I mean, yeah. It's, Sorry, oh, go, Matt. Oh, it's pretty unrelated. Like my brain's gone on a total tangent about what um, uh, Hayden said regarding neural load and immersion. Because, like, when I go to Quest, which 
when you compare it to something like Bicoline, is pretty crap. I mean, having tents compared to like full on medieval buildings, like it's nothing. But I go to Quest and I'm able to get in character and I'm like, yeah, here I am. I'm my character. I'm going to do my thing. And I role play the whole time. Then I go to Bicoline and I'm surrounded by these amazing buildings and everything looks medieval and you can hear the forge in the background. And I'm like, yep, here I am. It's me, Madeline, in a medieval village. Cool. <laughs> And like I can't get into character. And I don't I don't know if it's That's because right. I know. I know and I'm here and I'm, I'm surrounded by all this beautiful stuff and like maybe it's because my French is horrible so I can't get into a lot of the role play over there. I don't know what it is, but I have so much a much easier time role playing at Quest or role playing at like Caligo Mundi LARPs than they do at Bicoline. And I don't know. I just thought I'd throw that out there as like because you know we're all kind of saying like you know a oh, great costuming and like a great environment, nothing compares, and like it's it's great. But I don't know because if I'm thinking logically, especially as a person with issues um, regarding you know like sensory overload and that kind of stuff. I would think that being surrounded and immersed in my environment would make it easier to be in character. Yet somehow it doesn't. I don't know. I just thought I'd throw that out there because I thought it was kind of weird. Because well, also there's the there's the sort of thing there with like familiar and unfamiliar information. Because um, I know for myself, like if it's a new environment, I am thinking way too hard about all the new information and I can't concentrate. It's the same, like, but at the same time, like if if Everyone around me, including myself, is speaking in an accent, even if it's awful. If I can tell they're trying, it's easier to stay in character than if, you know, I can hear myself and everyone else speaking in an Australian accent because my brain is like, oh, these are my friends who I know. We're fucking around. And it takes me out of that um, immediately, which, yeah, I don't know if that's sort of coming into play at Beacon at all. Um with the sort of social environment it has, because I know literally nothing about it. Definitely. The language barrier definitely uh, causes a bit of that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, so, Xeniox a while back asked if we could have a look at character creation, sorry, culture creation responsibility. Culture and I think creation. That, I think it's a really interesting slider, and I think it's one that the different LARPs represented among the panel actually all took a fairly different point of view towards it. And I think that that would be interesting to talk about. Um, so when we talk about culture creation responsibility, what we're talking about is how much of, sorry, how much of your world, how much of your factions, how much of the people, the characters in your game are built by different, by players and how much of it is written down in a Bible that your character players have to read and then write your characters around. And then, or how much of it do you let your players write down in a Bible that then the new players have to write? Um, but, so for Watchers of East Haven, for example, we wrote down all the all the cultures and we said, here are the cultures, play one of these. Uh, you write your character off these cultures, right? We've written them. Um, whereas I think, Rob, do you want to talk about the Black Powder version? Uh, yeah, the Black Powder version, we wrote the cultures and then gave them out and said, hey, everyone, play one of these. It's essentially the same, honestly. Uh, that but is we not have... my experience. <laughs> <laughs> but we have noticed uh, that the players have um, breathed life into those cultures as well, and we're happy <laughs> to let them do it. So that's sort of you know a step away from... Uh, the GM's purely writing everything. We've sort of created a starting point and then gone, hey, guys, play in the sandpit. Here you go. You um, took me to an entire dinner where you made me write half the Uruk culture, and there was a bunch of players there that you were making write the Uruk culture. Are you saying that didn't happen to other people? As a founding member of Padris, I'd like to say that did not happen uh, to us. 
Oh, that sucks to you then. No, we um, specifically... Okay, maybe, maybe the black powder one was much more like... Yeah, the a better example uh, of contrast from um, black powder and uh, Mark... Uh, damn it. Uh, and East Heaven would be what happened at Legends of Markoth, which I was uh, uh, somewhat involved in, um, where the organizing team wrote um, a couple of... Uh, it, was a, it was a battle game, so there's two sides, and the organizing team wrote some background for the two sort of general camps... Um, and then gave the players uh, and uh, faction leaders the opportunity to fill in the blanks. Uh, we went sort of, here's, here's some starting points, here's some ideas. If these are things that you want to play, fantastic. And then if you want to add to that yourselves, that's also fantastic. So a step up, uh, a, a step away uh, further um, al along that fader from you know, the, the level of GM and organizer control that might go into it and a bit more towards uh, the, the older swordcraft where it was bring whatever you and your crew want to bring and we'll make it fit. Mads, did you want to? Oh, I was just thinking of after the fall, actually. I don't know what your mm. experience uh, with this was, but I mean, personally, it was kind of like, hey, do you want to be the leader of a faction and be an NPC? And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Why not? Uh, what, what faction am I leading? And they're like the junkers. And I went, oh, okay, cool. Sounds good. What's that? Oh, they were tire armor. And like, you know, I had like this paragraph kind of description that was very aesthetic. It was very much about what they wear and that, you know, they wear cool stuff and they go into the waste and that was it. And I'm like, oh, okay, so who's my character? Oh, you tell us. And like everything around the junkers, mama vulture, all those characters, and the whole Oprah cult, like that, none of that was written in the actual synopsis of the game. That was just me going like, oh, crap, I've got 35 people I have to be responsible for. What do I do? And so, what, it, so what lessons, Mads, does that give to LARP writers? Um, as a LARP writer myself, uh, I now like to give people a fair amount of information because I think that if people don't get information about the character they're supposed to be playing, uh, while some people may interpret that as exciting and an opportunity, other people are going to interpret that as a lack of support. Um, so I, th I think if you're going to have faction heads, if you're going to have people who are collaboratively designing your lore, you need to make it clear at the beginning that they are going to be doing that. And if there are parameters or, I mean, I, I absolutely love ATF. I adore that game. Like that, I adore every single character I interacted with. Um, but at the beginning there, it was a bit like, okay, what, what am I supposed to do? And I felt like as a NPC, it made it difficult for me to support my players in my faction since I was very, like, I felt like a mother hen. I had a lot of first time LARPers. So and again, here I am going kind of off topic here, but. Uh, it's not off topic. I mean, it, it does uh, definitely like highlight there's like an, another option, which is uh, delegate to an NPC <laughs> as a, yeah. another faction head at after the fall. I very much felt in the same boat as Matt's. Yeah. And I think you did. Yeah, I, I, I'm curious I did. about your experience too. The same. Um, yeah, no, basically the same, except I, I didn't really have an opportunity to put as much effort into uh, creating a shared lore and background and more focused on um, supporting the players with their individual concepts and um, some thematic elements like going for the uh, the X-Men, um, you know, Professor X versus Magneto concept for the, for the mutants. But so as LARP designers, bringing it back to a topic... Um, there's there's risks associated with delegation. Um, your NPCs or players delegated to write law can feel alienated or unsupported, or they might not do a, a particularly fantastic job at it, or they they might do an amazing you job. You did a great like job. You did. <laughs> did a great job. Yeah. Um, no, I I. The, there are these big risks, right? But if you look at after the fall, um, and the big risk. I mean, all of those people, the faction heads all got the the lack of support feeling sort of thing. But I think that actually they all did amazing work. And I think that we wouldn't... I don't think that the writers of After the Fall... 
I don't think that their time was best spent writing a brilliant Mama Vulture. I don't think their time was spent best spent writing a brilliant Brother Gregory or a brilliant, um, you know, face-eating guy. Um, I can't believe I forgot Uncle that Boss. guy's name. Uncle he was Boss. the best. Uncle Boss! Yeah, yeah I don't think their yeah. time, Uncle Boss I don't think their time was best spent writing an excellent Billy Ray, you know. <laughs> but Billy Ray also spent I, I, we made up a bunch of stuff and then they made us rewrite it and or like limited what we were doing. Um, and I think that what should happen is maybe a bit more either accept the risks and say, yeah, you know, whatever you come up with, we're going to roll with it. And I think after the full did a wonderful job of doing that with the faction heads. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you know, the faction heads were a high point and the faction cultures were a high point for me for that game. And they were largely player created. For sure. Yeah. Um, for sure. And the organizers made space for that to happen. But it is a risk and you do have to be prepared to accept that those player cultures will go where you don't want them to. Yeah. Just to, an, as, as an aside, um, for, from our, from, uh, for the Hobbit's Hoedown, we kind of took the idea of culture creation responsibility um, in a slightly different manner. Um, it wasn't just the, like, it's not culture or kind of, but it wasn't so much like a, how in Black Powder and Bloodlines there is culture creation for, like, Padris or, like, we did have factions, um, but they were families. Um, but what was our main focus was that we were actually designing the culture of the player base, the, the community. Um, and we wanted to make sure that everyone felt like that they belonged somewhere, um, as in their families, so that they would feel safe to go off and interact with other families and therefore a, most, a, a more social interaction would take place. So the 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 design or the responsibility of culture creation kind of fell to um us as organizers or we felt that it was closer towards like our responsibility as um as larp organizers to sort of be able to help foster um all these people going into these families and trying to um uh, hype everyone up to sort of encourage each other very, very openly um, and to be super supportive of each other so that it would become infectious. And that f therefore, um, not only were we sort of trying to um, affect the culture of the um, the player base, the community, we were um, affecting uh, the cultures of each family by having um, really supportive uh, our our, each of our organisers being in each of those families to be very, very supportive. Uh, and we tried as well to basically then in, um, involve ourselves in the overall culture or like the in-game, in-character culture of, of the game in terms of, um, you know, everyone tending to hype each other up and, and not to be too harsh to one, uh, towards one another, trying to, to only say... Um, very nice encouraging things or to be like well it didn't go well this time but like you'll get it or it doesn't matter it's not that serious so um w we felt it sort of had to have a, like a top-down kind of situation for us and that we knew that it would filter throughout our, our player base and eventually it would become so infectious that everyone would feel quite fondly towards each other and the play would be so much more comfortable because everyone would feel more accepted um, amongst each other. So that's kind of how we viewed uh, like culture creation responsibility for, from my point of view anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just wanted to sort of append to that, like, cause yeah, sort of with the families, there were those documents which sort of, ultimately ended up acting sort of as writing prompts almost. Um, and then you had the, the you know, organizers as sort of family heads. Um, and I remember at one point during the game, because sort of like uh, you you were the one for the fair motors, but you were in all the groups and were able to see what everyone was doing, what was happening. Um, 
but I was sort of just in the uh, in the Higgleby family, and I remember that sort of the initial sort of intention was Higgleby's were supposed to be like mischievous and pranksters, um, which came through in some ways. But I remember at the game you sort of were like dunking on me for like none of us were doing the pranks; it was all your family. But like the Higgleby's ended up all having ADHD, um, and you know, sort of being like uh, still like rascally, but in a very different way because like. Can I can I just point out that the design brief said we like doing pranks, but we're also lazy. And I'm pretty sure everyone read that and they were like, ah, lazy, lazy. Yeah, well, because it's also like, because that's, that's what Tam and myself, like, we were sort of the faction heads. And that's what Tam and myself are like. Like, I was like, yes, love the idea of pranks. Want that for me. I'm going to focus on building things um, and didn't organize any pranks. And, like, Tam sort of did something similar with food. And so it's like. Yeah, I, I was like, I found that interesting because those prompts still did come through and it felt like each family group did have its sort of own unique, I mean, culture, like, you know, unique sort of vibe and way of relating to one another and like stuff like that. But um, it it didn't sort of end up initially how he'd expected it. Um, and it's sort of because you see you, you see a similar thing with sort of uh, – because I think Swordcraft is probably the best example of looking at something like that, where it's like they threw, like, because it's such a big game, and again, for so long, it's sort of Warbands, it was sort of like, if you've got the players and you've got unique colors, your concept is whatever you want. And that's kind of like the the version of just having a player base throw ideas at the wall and seeing what sticks. And like, there are a lot of concepts thrown at the wall for Warbands by the player base over the years. And like, um, you know, even with my own Warband, I know we've rebooted like five or six times now, you know, both soft and hard reboots and um, sort of the way even there, like unique player cultures have evolved from different origins is really interesting. And like, because I think there is something to be said for creating a prompt and even uh, as Destiny mentioned, having sort of organizers or uh in in your and rob's case like uh cast roles in place to sort of help guide that but letting the players come up with that content in an environment where you have someone who can be like mm, maybe that idea is not good or needs work but like when they come up with something good you can be like yes that's great more of that that really sort of fits the vibe because it also takes the load as rob mentioned off the writers because now the writers aren't the ones writing that culture and they don't have to impress it upon people. Those people are making it for themselves and they can work on other things. Um, yeah. I mean, and also, I mean, that's what you're saying, where it's a choice between where you're spending your time. And you can spend your time designing cultures and spend and talking to all your players and making sure they all understand what your culture is and putting out excellent documentation about what the culture's look is, or you can spend your time on other parts of your game. And I think that's an important design decision. And I think with After the Fall, they offloaded that. And with Swordcraft, they offload that. Um, and with The Hobbit Showdown and with most of Black Powder, they were like, no, we want to do spend the time to do that writing, right? And because the directors and writers, the LARP rights vision of those cultures was more important than the, the idea of letting the players own it or the risks were too great or whatever. Um, and I think that's an important distinction. And I, I'm, when I say that, it came out kind of... Uh, negative, but I don't think it is negative. I think it's uh, just a decision about where your priorities are. And I think saying our vision for this culture is very strong and you must adhere to it and we're going to write it so you do is a fine decision to take if that's what decision you want to take. There are some potentially strong design reasons um, for 
organizers to retain control of uh, of culture, whether it be because certain cultures give out stat bonuses, like in Watches of East Haven, or because you have uh, a, an intri- a intricate network of conflicts that you want to set up, like in the case of Black Powder. Um, in those situations, uh, if you're writing an org- if you're writing a game where you want to control a certain axis of conflict or cooperation, then cultures can be really important um, for reinforcing those lines of that that narrative. I think that feeds into another fader. Um, I'm not sure if we're getting to loyalty to world, um, but that's definitely something that pushes in that direction. If you um, give up that potential lever of control of your game to the players, then you're giving up that level of potential control to your players. Whereas retaining it might be really important for the type of game that you want to run. If you want to run a great big war between houses, which you, which are preset and you want a certain number of sides, then you should probably control it. If you want, you know, we, we run a fight every week, then it doesn't really matter what they are. So you give it up to the, to the players. So the, Whatever the reasons, it's important that you make the decision consciously. Um, yeah, just I quickly, think... sorry, Des. Yeah. Um, yeah right. Apocus, sorry, apocostasis, uh, all direction is restrictive. Um, the question is how restrictive are you willing to be as designers? I think all direction is restrictive. Sorry, go on, Des. Um, yeah, uh, we've got another question from uh, Zeniox Gaming. Uh, what about in terms of community culture, IRL, i.e. expectations of player base in terms of their conduct towards one each- another slash uh, your admin org team's conduct towards player, etc. Et- et um, I guess that's kind of how I viewed the cu- culture creation for the Hobbit's Hoedown um, or that particular... Um, um, view of of culture creation um i just tried to meld it as much as possible knowing that like um the the type of game that i was going to be asking my players to engage in was going to be a little bit different from what they've experienced being that they've been to um pretty rules heavy types of games like songcraft um like um black powder and bloodlines which comes a little bit further away from like heavy mechanics and after the fall which has like it has items it has like stats um it's a very numbers heavy kind of game um so knowing that there were going to be uh that there were ways that people can tend to um power game so to speak, uh, those uh, those kinds of games that can have like heavy mechanics. Uh, I basically wanted to strip that so bare that there wasn't any way that anyone could do that. Um, <laughs> and so it, it 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 like the 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 rules themselves can actually influence pretty harshly the the way that the the community engages with each other and also the the organizers and how you represent your mixing desk ideals. Um, yeah, especially if your game is a competition, uh, if your rules are suited to a particular kind of player, those players will become prominent in the play environment and good or bad, that's something you need to be prepared for. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you write and run a game around, um, you know, being the best at playing cards, then people who like being the best at playing cards will come and play your game. Um, If you write a game in which you're allowed to be a racist and that's okay in your game, then some of your players will be racists. Um, and they'll come to your game and they'll be like, yes, this is a game where it's safe for me. If you, and maybe that's like, um, a choice that you make to explore that and your aim is to, I don't know, do some art with those people, they will turn up though. And you need to be aware of that. Um, sorry, I'm not saying that games where you're allowed to be a racist are bad. I'm not saying that. 
I'm there's, saying I mean there's there's you definitely need to get teachable what <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's definitely like teachable moments in LARP. I mean, like for for a lot of the the LARPs that I I write, I intend to write, I'm trying to like send a message through an artistic piece, uh, and sometimes that does mean that you are going to maybe explore uncomfortable topics, um, and and maybe give people sort of a point of view that. Um, you're you're trying to 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 get across, and I think that um, definitely uh, the mixing desk becomes a vehicle for that. Mm. Uh, so that being said, let's move on to character creation responsibility because that kind of meshes with what we've been talking about. Um, so character creation responsibility uh i guess the two opposites are from organizer versus player so this is basically um how much responsibility is given to the players to create their characters um to put into the world that you've created for them or um how much of it is for the organizer that they've written a full-on role and they cast players into those roles um does anyone want to pitch in on how both of those things can be useful or um, the, the ways in which they've used that yeah, um, yes. spectrum on in oh. their own? Uh, I was just going to say, like, a good example of casting roles is Murder Mystery Nights. Um, uh, you know, those are, like, uh, especially because those are often sort of aimed at, like, inexperienced people, like... Um, the reason you would create or cast a role is because either you want that role to fill a specific function or you have someone who's not very confident in doing the thing that they're doing and you've taken away a lot of the work for them and they now have something to work with, even if what they end up doing with it is so far off what you expected. Um, they, yeah, that's that was my contribution. It also, it also allows for a relatively low investment joining in on the game, um, which is why you see so many con games that have it. Like you can spend, if you've only got a very limited amount of time to play your game, then you want to spend less of that writing characters and more of it running the game. Um, or more of it actually playing the game. And I can see Rob's face frowning at me about character creation is game. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I saw it. But um, my, my uh, study is very hot. Ah, you poor thing. Um, why are you wearing a jumper? Sorry, I'm off topic. Okay, more to the yes. point. The point is that um, written characters create a very different game to home-made characters, to player-made characters. Um, and you can get some really beautiful and really interesting conflicts by writing a bunch of characters for people to play and interlocking their relationships in interesting ways and it creates really good drama um if you write it well but it's also a fuck ton of work so much work yes so much i can work. confirm that writing 26 player briefings in a night is a really 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 large amount of work yeah, really I mean, large amount of work. Rob but... and I have run games where we wrote <laughs> all the characters for people, and they weren't. They were sometimes really good, and sometimes not so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, it's actually my one... favorite kind of game. Really? Yeah, yeah. I love games where you're cast. Like the first ever LARP I went to, I was cast, and not having to write my own character. And, you know, having set goals and things I was trying to accomplish uh, was terrifying, for one thing, but probably less terrifying than it would have been if I'd written that character myself. And, I mean, the next LARP that I run, like, I will probably, I mean, you know, I've collaborated on a few things that never happened because we couldn't find the right venue. Get your venue first, everyone. Um, but I love writing all the characters because it ends up, you're basically writing a novel and then throwing it to chance and being like, let's see how this ends. And as an example in New Zealand, so the first game I played was Governor's Dinner Party that was actually written by one of my very good friends. 
Uh, it was an excellent steampunk LARP of, I don't know, I want to say between 30 and 50 players. I don't remember. But they've now run it multiple times, like three or four different times. And it always has a different ending. It always has a different ending. And I love that. I love the fact that you can write the same characters and put them in the same scenarios, but the people playing them are going to give you a different outcome. I think that's like, that's the magic of LARP. That's people. I love it. I think yeah. that's really exciting. So, uh, yeah. I think I, as I well at- that it's a... No, you go, Des. Sorry. Rob, you've been cut off four times <laughs> um, now. Just speak, Rob. Uh, okay. All right. So I wanted to <laughs> give a demonstrative... I was going to say... The... I wanted to give a demonstrative <laughs> example, right? Okay. So for our viewers uh, at home, uh, I'd like to give a demonstrative example of the, like, one end, the middle, and the other end of this fader that we're talking about, right? So imagine tabletop role-playing games, yeah? This is Hero Quest. Hero Quest is great. They give you a character sheet. You play the game. You have fun, you do the thing. It, it's great, right? This is Apocalypse World. They give you the character sheet, and you fill in a bunch of stuff yourself. But they, they kind of write the characters for you, right? Apocalypse World is great. This is D&D. They give you a bunch of stats to create a character from. D&D is pretty great. This is a blank piece of paper. You could just write everything yourself with whatever you want, and a role-playing game run in that game in that way, that could be pretty great too. The point being that all of these options can be absolutely fantastic as long as you're doing them on purpose, which is like the throughput. We've got all these fantastic stories about all these different types of games. It's just you know vital that you, the designers, make the call about what kind of game you want to run. Do you want to run Hero Quest? Do you want to run Apocalypse World? Do you want to run D&D? Do you want to run... Who fucking knows? Like, make that call and then roll with it. And also tell your players that's what you're running. Yeah. Because if you tell too. your players that you're running, um, for example, a game in which all of their things are written for them, and then you reveal yourself to be an untrustworthy GM, your game might be terrible. Just terrible. We can have trust issues. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And trust issues make for really bad games. Every single time. Um, I think for for um, it it can be really useful if you have like if you're a LARP designer who has a very very strong intention or vision for your game, writing characters for the game can make sure that like you're getting that across as much as possible, um, even to your players, and that you're communicating. Uh, things with them, like the secrets that they have, um, the secrets that they have with other um, players, the um, relationships that they have uh, with with other um, characters, can also foster making sure that your your player base is interacting with each other, and they're kind of forced to do that. Um, rather than just sort of like leaving it to chance like just in just in case you want to be like I want my players to get out there and um you know kind of really really take my game um by the jugular and and making sure that kind of happens um that's one of those ways that you can do it um for the hobbit toe down we tried to have a more hands off approach however i mean it still had some character creation responsibility from the organizers because we literally gave everyone a last name and a family and then said put yourself here somewhere (laughs) and your personalities are a wash of this kind of thing um so you said we're all hobbits yes indeed i did i was like no other things allowed this is a hobbit's hoedown everyone else get out of here everyone has to be a dragon go make your own game (laughs) Yeah, Can or I play a Ramian like, spy? You can't play a Ramian spy. We have enough Ramian spies. Um, but the, like, Watchers of East Haven, we made everyone cops, right? We're like, you're all fantasy cops. And people are like, oh, I want to play not a fantasy cop. And we're like, cool, there are several games available for you to go and play not a fantasy cop. But this game is about fantasy cops. So if you would like to not play it, don't play it. Um, which I think is really important. You have to communicate your game to your players. Um, yeah, Unless it's absolutely. a game design not to. 
So yeah, I've right. played one of those and it was terrible. I've tried I've, to run uh, one of those I, and it was terrible. I'm not mentioning I which game. I also have I'm... run one of those, which I believe at least one panelist here has participated in, and I can confirm it was terrible. <laughs> uh, lesson lesson learned, GM. You should not run a game where the players can't trust you. That's just it's just bad practice. It is like sure that's a fader. There's one setting where that fader should be, uh, and that's at the responsible end, not at the irresponsible end. Um, alrighty. So, an uh, another. Shall we move on to another fader? Yeah. Alrighty. Mm, cool. I so, kind of, I don't know. I know that at least one of our panelists wanted to finish reasonably soon. Um. Is that a hard ending? One, one more fader at least. Are we good? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do. Let's do the entire desk. Let's All right, as well. One okay, so there is the runtime game mastering: active versus passive. Um, so this is kind of like whether or not. Once you've written the game and the 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 game has started, um, how much of it you're leaving in the hands of your players? Um, are you, as a GM, an active or passive sort of presence in the in the in the game during the runtime? Um, it's it. I think that for. Uh, the Hobbit's Hoedown, that they're relatively passive. They're not very active. Um, but we had the luxury of also creating in-game characters so that anything that happened in-game could be handled in-game because it didn't... There wasn't anything that we weren't handling um, that wasn't party-related and therefore didn't yeah, mostly you know, what I it had was relevance. Like bushfire or medical emergency, really. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll first of all pass this off on to to Rob to ask him about um, Black Powder and Bloodlines uh, runtime game mastering. Yeah, so um, again, following my theme of setting the boundaries of where this uh, this slider sits at each end, you know, hundred uh, percent. Um, game master activity would be like a tabletop role playing game where the GM's literally describing everything, or a step down from there with some of the linear games I played where you get, oh, GM, what do I see? And the GM says, oh, there's like five monsters at the end of the tunnel. They're goblins, but we don't have any costuming for them. Just pretend they're goblins. Um, or at the very, very low end of GM activity where you can basically clock off for a pint as soon as time in starts and. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you do, the game will run, or if there's no GM at all during game time. Um, in terms of Black Powder, we have a pretty specific style that we tend to do anyway, um, which is where we really like to see what the players are actually doing during the game um, so that we can tailor the overall narrative and encounters to it. Um, to, to meet what players are needing to do and their level of activity and interest and boredom, whether the story is going in the right direction and all that sort of thing. So I'd say we are pretty heavy on the active side, but um, not so much in the interacting directly with players and explaining the game to them. Um, more in terms of the the controlling the super narrative um, and the availability of resources, whether that be characters or physical stuff in the game for the assistance of telling the story. So we'd be at like three quarters of the way towards active, um, but in possibly a, a different way than you might expect. Cool. Do we want to pass it off on to... Um, <laughs> on, on, on to... Um, Joe or Madeline? Uh, Matt, I'm happy I'm to go. Just, I'm just um, thinking about how, um, as a person running Swordcraft, we're at the absolute mercy of our players sometimes, but then there, it goes the other way as well in regard to 
battles and where they're being run and things like that. They can't affect that. All they can do as players is either turn up to do the fight or not do the fight. And I mean, that's, that's their decision. And if they don't show up and the other team wins, then obviously there are consequences. So, I mean, they do have a little bit of autonomy in that. But then I just think about mornings when I wake up and I go to the meeting and Peterson's like, oh, they killed the magistrate. And I'm like, oh, really? Did, did people notice? And he's like, yeah, everyone knows he's dead. I'm like, oh, well, I guess he's actually dead. And we should probably write some story around this now. <laughs> like, uh, We're very much at the mercy of our own players in that if they do something and they convince enough people that it happened, it happened. And we've got to be like, okay, well, we didn't really plan for that, for that to happen this game. I mean, that's on us for not planning for absolutely every scenario in the book, but I guess we better uh, really quickly write that in and figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to replace the magistrate and who the new one is. So it's, it's interesting because on one hand we're very passive, but on the other hand, we're very not like it's, I would say yeah. like there's a like there's a passivity about maybe like story elements, but like you like everyone who's played Sawcraft for more than a year has a like a story about a time when a marshal call at a quest like uh, you know screwed them or won them something because there was a rule that no one had encountered yet and a call that yeah. had been made and like like lots of weird stuff. So like yeah, there are definitely stuff like that, but. I would largely agree with you. I think it's been pretty hands off for the majority of the time I've played. Um, and I mean, like another example of that is, you know, we had one quest where instead of going to the bar on the last night, everyone decided they're going to just sit in the ditch outside the bar and there are invitations going around being like, join the ditch party. And they're all just standing in the bar being like, what the hell are they doing? And I was I wasn't an organizer at this point. I was a player, so I'm sitting in that ditch and I'm like, this is the best party ever, everybody. Like it was just the fact that, yeah, you can't do anything about that. And I think at Swordcraft, players can take things far further than other games because once you get that mob mentality, what that they have that power, they can just take it and go. And we're like, okay, bye. <laughs> have fun. <laughs> Well, that's the joy of passive GMing, right? Where you have, mm. where it's watching what the cool stuff the players do. Where you, <laughs> that's what passive GMs get to do, and that's that's why you would choose a passive GM style. Whereas, like a game with a very active GM style might go, ah, oh, cool, the ditch is on fire. Everyone in the ditch in five seconds yeah. is dead. Out of the ditch. Or they might say, ah, oh, you're all in the tavern now. It's twenty minutes later. Like. Mm. The, the the and those are those are both terrible GMs who say things those like horrible. that. But you can do active GMing well. It's just a very different game. Um, There's also something to be said about um, the value of either style of GMing uh, based on scale, because um, I, I certainly know that scaling up from games of uh, six or seven people with a bunch of NPCs to 10 people with a bunch of NPCs to 20 to 30 to now 100 or so with Black Powder, there's a certain level, there's like a critical mass that happens where regardless of whether you're running a, like a, a player conflict-driven game or a player cooperation-driven game, um, the players will interact naturally more with each other and it comes a point where you as a gm simply can't be there for all of the activity and a level of passivity or at least distance is really forced on you as an organizer so um making this decision about how active you intend for your gms to be during time in time out does get forced a little bit by the scale of the game but also i think we're seeing like different flavors of active versus passive where um you know deciding uh, whether you as the GMs are going to focus on controlling the super narrative or just letting it go and seeing what happens. Um, like if you compare Black Powder versus Quest, um, like we're very much in control of our, in control of our super narrative um, to, to some pretty fine detail, even if we're not out there saying, okay, so what you can see on that hill is three goblins and a giant spider. Um, they're, they're spitting acid at you. What you what do you do? Like basically table topping um, versus going, okay, well, We've put our stuff in play at the start of the game. Go, let's see what happens. So that larger scale games lend themselves to that sort of 
scale of active versus passive whereas at a smaller scale of game it's description versus props more yeah, as a sort like, of discussion you'd be having on that note like at black powder something some of the uh myself and some of the other armed old town players noticed is if we left that created like the the we sort of noticed that like the gms would tend to send more monsters at that time because suddenly the town is unprotected um and so we were sort of like because uh, i know some people are like oh i've been standing around there's not a lot to do and we sort of were like oh if we all find a reason to leave something will happen and suddenly the players aren't bored so we started sort of tactically removing ourselves from places that we thought needed protection so like things would get attacked or tried to find ways to like hint to the gms that we wanted to be attacked by monsters so we had a fight um, and and in this way sort of like sort of like uh almost if you you know compare like gms to management and players to like you know the the union like we sort of all these arms because like old adelina more so than the new world has this sort of very stark distinction between heavily armed players and players with almost no weaponry at all and if all the heavenly armed players are gone, or have unionized and decided to like leave, suddenly they are to an extent controlling the flow of the game because, you know, their job there is literally to protect. They're all sort of like lower status player or like lower status characters. Um, but we, yeah, we were like, oh, cool, we'll just leave. Something will happen. Uh, drama will happen, and we get more game out of that. So let's like, there was sort of an element of like, you know out of character we were like if we fuck around like more things the, the opportunity for more things to happen takes place and um i noticed like we were talking about it after the game and like because one of the players who was really new to black powder was actually getting really annoyed that we were doing this tactically foolish thing of trying to cause things to happen because he's used to the sort of swordcraft game where if you aren't playing it safe and having a much duller game you are putting your ability to win at risk Whereas at Black Powder, because uh, there's no sort of like win condition like that, uh, if you uh, don't play it safe and things go wrong, you get a you that leads to other things. Like you get to do stuff with that. Um, and Black so, Powder, like, the game where you can hide in a bush for three and a half hours, and yeah, it it affects the game or it doesn't. I don't know. It's it's a oh, sorry. I don't really have anything to say watching. here. Yeah, that's yeah. It's a I feeling. I guess my question <laughs> is: Do you feel, as players, like that's a designed experience? For sure, for sure. Yeah, I think so. I think um, it helps to drive the way uh, that I approach play. Um, it it means that you know uh, the. <sighs> The experiences that we're trying to get out of each other, I think, come from a different place, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I guess my point there is that active GMing means that the players are interacting with the GM a lot more. And whether that's subtle, like Black Powder's, you know, heavily armed players sneaking it, wandering off to leave things unprotected so that more monsters attack, blah, 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 or whether it's a very unsubtle like watches player walk up to gm hey we want this plot to happen we're going to do the plot now um that's active gming is where the players are asking a lot from the gms and interacting with the gms um and the gms are interacting with the players and the plot whereas passive gming is much more that you know they've written the plot and they put it out there and the players interact with it, and the players are not thinking about interacting with the GMs. Maybe the GMs come and do stuff with them, but they're not spending time, they're not making decisions based on how the GMs will react to the decisions, right? Yeah. Does that make sense, or was that just rambly? No, makes perfect sense. Um. That being said, I think this is a great time to segue into Story Engine, which is collaborativity versus competitivity. Um, so what motivates the players in your game? Um, is there something to win or a goal to obtain? Um, or is it like you're playing to lose? 
uh, you can get really interesting stories and stronger player experiences um, when you sort of make this one of your your focus points, I guess. Um, for for the Hobbit's Hoedown, and I know I keep referring to this because that's literally the the one lap that everyone has come to play Joking. from mine. But um, it's yeah, it's basically that uh, for for us, it was that there were no win conditions, and uh, it kind of was that your players would get into trouble, but that it would be lighthearted trouble, and everyone would forgive you very quickly. Uh, and it was all for the story. It was all for the the um, the memories that you would create that would you would hold in your heart and think back on it and be like, that was just a warm sunny day in November, and I loved it. Like, and and I think that um, with with Swordcraft, conversely, it it can be very very competitive because it is about you know war and and battle and um it it can be a very thrilling um adventure game to 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 play and be part of um and i guess that like weirdly enough um or not weirdly enough but i would say that maybe black powder and bloodlines kind of exists like between those spectrums i guess yeah you want to yeah, I'll, I'll field that uh, that soft one. Thank you. Um, Black Butter and Bloodlines does indeed exist in the middle because we deliberately wanted it to be about conflict. Uh, Black Butter and Bloodlines is a game about conflict. And so we are trying to ensure that it's a game where all axes of conflict um, are available for players to engage in and are in fact uh, players are encouraged to engage in it you've got um you know your your character's race human versus uruk you've got the uh, the five nations um of Aksh, padris iskalan tassinos uh, and angheim you've got the the many religions going on not just the holy patronic the major orthodoxy and the hundred gods but also now several <clears throat> splits and different denominations within those we've got the the breaking out down of social class uh, in the human cultures we've got the breakdown of uh, the clans in the Uruk culture uh, we've got the various professions which might have economic uh, reasons to cooperate or not cooperate we've got the um, like the the interpersonal relationships going on we've got the the two settlements going on uh, with the humans and the uh, Uruk camp as well all three of them interacting in competition for resources and then, then we've got external threats and then we've got internal threats and then we've got stories that we're running at the players so um like if you want to like specify a particular setting on the player versus player uh compared to player versus environment scale that a lot of video games would use um my answer would be uh black powder has chosen yes uh for that fader <laughs> yes all of it um rather than a, a specific set but i mean if you wanted to strictly say it's probably somewhere in the middle well, just a um, question i sort of i did want to ask of rob okay. just on that so sort of you know, going back to the anecdote I told before of us trying to bait out monster attacks, like, as game designers or organizers, like, how does that, like, how do you feel about players trying to do that? Like, how do you respond to that? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Do you want players doing that? Well, um, that brings up a conversation about metagaming, which I think is a, uh, like, a whole nother panel in and of itself. Um, a lot of people think that um, metagaming um, is, uh, for those who don't know, it's the idea of using out-of-game knowledge for the purpose of doing something in-game. Uh, a lot of people think that that's a purely negative. Um, I, I believe it's just a tool in either direction. And one of the important things about the way that, we, that I play LARP is using metagame knowledge to make a better game. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, thumbs up, Hayden. Well done. I would have done the same. Like, if you think that any action that you do will make a better game, particularly for other people, fuck, do it. Like, good game is good game. Yeah, and I think a really good example where whenever somebody's talking about metagaming as definitely a negative, my response is always, so when you meet a newbie on the field and it's their first game, do you just take them apart and walk off? Or do you, because you know that's a new player, do you, like, give them a good fight and have fun with them? Right? Um, 
when you're making choices around what's a better game or another one is the one where you're like, oh, I know this player has, you know, trauma around people shouting at her. So when my character becomes angry with her character, I am going to take a very low, angry voice instead of taking a shouty voice. And that's metagaming because you are not, you're using your out of character knowledge and it's changing what your character would do. And if you don't do it, you're kind of an asshole. Can we do a whole panel on the ethic? Do we have one about ethics? Oh, and ethics of oh, game let's. writing, oh God, but also yes. playing? Because there's so much interesting stuff there regarding trust and consent and triggers and like, yeah, we'll write that one down, Des. And I'm really yeah. writing it down. <laughs> yeah. I've, like, I, I have done some horrific things that were like, completely allowed within play spaces that I now look back on and I'm like, wish I hadn't done that, really contributed to harming the game. Oh, but, but it was fine because your character would act that way, right? Right? Oh, no. my God. Oh, God. Right? Oh, oh, my God. Sorry. No. Hard but segue. But, we're yeah. all very proud of you for learning from it because the thing is that it's okay to make mistakes. What we need to do is learn from those mis as mistakes and mm -hmm. do better. Right? Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. So what was the slider and, again? Um, it, it's um, Competitive versus collaborative. Yeah, com yeah, so the story engine. Um, the, and, basically the motivator of, of um, mm -hmm. your, your players. And I think that collaborative game can be about conflict. Like, if we're thinking, I mean, because we have a half-written 90s horror LARP, um, mm -hmm. and in that LARP, it's a very collaborative story engine about trying to take each other apart, right? And you have yeah. a game where... I'm trying, my character is trying to kill your character and where you and I as players are going to collaborate on how that works and what's going to happen and whether or not I'm going to win. Um, where, uh, so I think, whereas, yeah, like Black Powder, where it's like a very conflict-driven game is also not as competitive as a conflict-driven game might be. Because often in many of those conflicts, I'm playing to lose them because I'm collaborating with the other player. Yeah, and you get, I think Black Powder has a lot of players like that. Like my husband, he plays kind of the head of the Charleston, well, self-appointed head of the Charleston militia. And sure, he can spend his whole game terrorizing people and arguing with old Adelina, but he willfully chooses to spend as much of the game as possible, basically crawling around in the bush and that's it he's like he wants to spend as much time as humanly possible in the trees and that's it like i can't even find him half the time and that's just how he wants to play the game like sure he that's could be beautiful. competitive he could play to win and instead he's like wow the great ocean road all that beautiful scenery i'm just going to disappear into that and i'll be walking walking down the road and i'll see him out of the corner of my eye like skulking through the bushes and i'm like yep that's it well, that's, <laughs> that's like that's why, why you've dressed up for this it's also like all the soldiers being like we're gonna fight the monsters in a line because that's how gentlemen fight um and we're gonna be dumb idiots and fight every monster that. or try and arrest it because monsters are human shaped and therefore probably people yeah and it's so good that they they that's that's an example of sacrificing competition for a better story for everyone right Whereas a competitive game design is one where you choose the most effective method to win, or you choose the most effective and most efficient. Well, like, it's, you it's know. a game where the win condition, by definition, cannot be held by multiple people. So yeah. that's, that's what I'd say the effect is. Mm. So, like, Black Powder doesn't have a win condition where only a handful or a single person can win, which is why players don't compete in the same way. Like it's not, it's it's not necessarily like the faction quest where it's like green faction wins and if it does, therefore none of the other factions win. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, so that that's what I'm talking about. Whereas like at Black Powder, it's like theoretically everyone could survive to the winter. 
like there are ancillary objectives as well but it's like you know uh and there are external pressures as you mentioned but it's like it's not the yeah. same where it's like there's a binary win or lose you either have won or you've lost yeah i mean there is that you either live or you die yeah but, well i mean i point. think that the the one of the things that black powder is not quite achieving where it wants to is where there's a couple of places where the game design is competitive rather than collaborative and it instead of a collaborative design around the drama of conflict and the exploration of the conflict and a couple of places it's like yes but there's a competitive game there and you're rewarded for winning the competitive game entirely. Um, but I think that ideally you want, it's an incredibly difficult design to get right. And I think Black Powder is genius design. Thank you. Um, but also there are, I mean, there's, there's the example that I gave halfway through the last game where I said, the Uruk are incentivized in every way to kill all humans. Except that we can't really kill all humans, but we are encouraged in every way to kill any individual human we find out in the bush, e.g. Mads' husband. As long as we can just make it look like a monster attack, which we can, uh, we're incentivized to end those players' games. And we don't do that because, again, out of character, we're not assholes. And so I think, so there's an example of where the player culture they've built defends against the, mis the like helps, helps the game stay good even when there are mistakes in the design. Because a really good culture holds, like if they had a crappy culture, and a culture of competitiveness and a culture where we were encouraged to dislike other players because of the faction they played, then the Uruk would be murdering randos in the shrubs all the time. And it would be a worst game for it, right? Yeah, I think as well that it helps to, like, then therefore hold tension. Because I think After the Fall does, like, a similar thing or did a similar thing in which it was really easy to die. Um as someone who died themselves pretty early. <laughs> um, R.A.P. Danny you know, May. I know. <laughs> um, Can we so, get an F in yeah. the chat for Danny May? <laughs> um, it's, it, it meant that, like, um, the threat of death is real and it also almost becomes, like, one of the themes of the game. Um, bro? Yeah, with regards to the threat of death being real, um, that is something that's really worth considering as a designer. Um, and this is like a possibly like a weird next level bullshit idea. But one of the things I keep saying to people who are like, "What? Um, but but why is it so easy to kill someone?" when you're also saying make it like may, may take it seriously when you're trying to kill someone the answer is because we want that experience to go to our players um we want you the player to think oh but they put so much work into their costume oh but i'll ruin their day because a real person in the situation that your character is in would have a bunch of moral conflicts that which you are never going to be able to accomplish so using out of character meta information as a substitute for in character motivations um, is a design tool which you, the GM, if you're careful uh, and consciously go about using it, um, can in institute in your game. So we put in these big cultural out of character systems which say, don't commit a massacre, be nice to other players. The other players are your friends. You're all here to tell a story together. And then we put them in a situation of some pretty hardcore conflict and pretty hardcore competition and go, okay, so your characters would all have moral quandaries about winning these competitions, about doing the bad things that they would have to do to win. You, the players, have to negotiate the culture that we've put in place in parallel 
with the conflicts that your character should be having, but we know for a fact that you as players just aren't going to be able to simulate because no player, like, you, there's just no way that you, a player, uh, are are going to feel the same way that a 14th century Englishman is going to feel about a wild American native that like, or equivalent, um, that's, that's just not going to happen. So we put the systems in place to substitute, which is part of what I was getting at with Hayden's conversation about metagaming, about it being a good tool or a bad tool, something to think about. Yeah. I um, think that's for, for sure. Um, just so that we keep things moving along, um, who would we like to talk about loyalty, loyalty to setting or would we like to talk about um, bleed? Bleed is a more interesting conversation. I Great. think loyalty okay. to setting has some... Let's, let's talk about bleed. Let's do it. <laughs> I, would, I would like to talk to about, about all of it, but uh, I'm conscious of the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, also, it is also. Um, So, right. uh, bleed. Uh, it's basically um, the two uh, ends of those that spectrum is how close to home it is, or um, differentiation. So, um, using elements of uh, real life or reality. Um, do you deliberately try to uh, create distance from uh, the the player and the and the character, or do you use um, you know real life experiences to um, hammer home like a point, or are you trying to get away from that reality and? And, and distance them so that there is more um, of a, f like a fantastical element. Um, and yeah, I guess taken to the extreme, you might have players even play themselves um, just in an alternate setting. Uh, and it can lead to, um, you know, either lessening the player-to-player -player divide or making it harsher um, or making it less relatable or making it more relatable. Does anyone else want to weigh in on I all that? Because I, I don't have a lot to say on this topic, but I'm, I'll sort of go in early because it's like I'm, a, I'm aggressively neurodivergent. I've never felt emotional bleed related to character. So every character I've ever played, I've been like, I'm going to take a thing about myself and put, put it out there and go hard and have had mixed responses based on that. Um, but in terms of this, I think sort of one of the good things is like, and we sort of touched on it last week, is I really like having a, a political message or a, a something that you can say that is like improves people's understanding of one another and the world. Um, and yeah, but I remember, like, after the Hobbit lap, and you mentioned this to me, you were like, so many people came up to me and said, like, I feel so relaxed. I've been so stressed. And, like, this was in November last year, like, when things were bad, but before things got, like, 2020 bad. Um, and it was like, even though our LARP sort of was subtly a tool to radicalize people into collectivism, um, like, it was genuinely an escape for people from the horror of just the breakdown of, like, capitalism. Um, and that is something that I feel does have value. And I think that having at least some, something that you can have your players draw back to their, their real world experience is useful because I think it's good to like play a game to have fun, but it's like, especially if you're doing it with other people it's good to be able to take something positive from that experience that you can then take to your interactions with, with people in the real world. And I think more LARPs should try to do more of that. And I'm not saying that more LARPs don't, but it's just something I definitely would like to see more of on a very personal level. Yeah. I, I think... Well, I mean, this was a discussion that Rob and I had, what, 15 years ago, where we were like, a bit less than that. 
can we make LARP that makes people think about the real world rather than just an escapist thing? And now that's become a much more <laughs> common concept. And because when we were asking, our big question for the Zeppelin game design was, can LARP be art? And I think that now we know that the answer is obviously yes um, in many ways. But um, I want to pitch a LARP for everybody right now where I'm like, I've written a LARP and it's called Long Live the Queen and it's about half a dozen or like eight to ten LARP rights and they run a LARP club together and the person who's the main director of the LARP club is leaving and they have to pick a new director. And now... <laughs> Um, and then they all sit down for an evening together to do that, and then all of the old conflicts come up, and that's the LARP. And that's a LARP that is close to home on the bleed scale, right? That is a LARP <laughs> that organisers should never, ever play. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, should always play. Oh, my God. Uh, whereas a LARP that's very far away on the bleed scale might be um, Watches V-Saven, right? Where your fantasy cops and all of the problems are easily solved. By throwing um, Tato at them. By throwing, yeah, crocodiles who eat stuff at them. Oh, God. <laughs> all um, right. Sorry. So, Don't look at uh, I, it's, it's worth acknowledging... <laughs> Uh, really strongly that um, bleed isn't just bad stuff. Bleed can be good stuff too. Mm. If you come out of a LARP and you go, oh, that made me feel really happy in my soul, uh, like some uh, some people have said about um, Hobbit Throwdown, yeah. that's great. But that's also a bleed. Um, yeah. If you come out of a LARP going, oh, God, I feel empowered to um, be my own person and be more confident in the world and that makes you more attractive to the people of your chosen gender or genders. Um, that's bleed. Uh, and that's another, another good bleed. Um, but if you, if you come out and you go, Oh God, I feel so depressed because that was uh, an awful experience for my character, even though I personally had a good time, that's, that's bleed too. Um, so you as a designer have control over what you do with that by the kind of uh, experiences that you put your players in. So it's, worth keeping in mind when you're designing those experiences what kind of feelings it it may evoke in your players yeah i think when um yeah well i mean i specifically did think about bleed um as a mechanic in in the hobbit's hoedown because um my experience with after the fall was that i um when i was danny may um, I created her very specifically in mind, thinking like I'm going to be meeting all these new people and I want to be able as much as possible to be able to talk with them, not to like, you know, create a lone character and then just never talk to anyone. Like I want to like actively meet new people. And so I made that, uh, I made connections. And then when I was in character, um, those connections solidified and then after the game, when I looked at the people who played those characters that I had those relationships with, I looked at them very, very fondly from then on in. And it was like, it was like two days tops that I knew them. But I was like, these are good people because I had such a good role play experience with them. And they've become very, very fast friends. So the idea of the Hobbit's Hoedown was that I was creating really great role play experiences um, between player to player and trying to get that sense of like familiarity between them so that they would feel comfortable and they'd look like I wanted players to look at each other and think like, you're like, I, I like you a lot. Like I, I wanted everyone to look at each other fondly. Um, and, and that, that I feel like that is good bleed. I, I was like, I want to be able to design um, a community that feels very, very good about each other. Yeah. And I mean, I think even like weeks after the Hobbit hoedown, 
months now, I still have experiences where when I'm stressed or angry, I look at my partner and we say, okay, what's the first rule of hobbits? And the first rule is don't stress. Just assume that everyone else is doing their best and that they're, you know, they're doing okay. And that my rule is don't stress. Just live my own life. Love that. Be my That's hobbity great. way. Right? Um, yeah. And I think that's one of the things I really admire about the design in that game, where that's the goal, and I think it hit it really hard. Thank you very much. That's that's great to, to hear. I'm, I'm really glad. I think that I, I kind of already knew that myself because I got to play it as, a, as, as an organiser and... I have so many very fond memories of it and yeah, it just makes me feel like it made me feel much more solidified in my friendships and it made me feel um, way more inspired about the the community as well because of um, just how much everyone turned up for each other. My God. Rob, you were about to say something. Oh, um, by contrast, Black Powder and Bloodlines is an exercise in giving everyone, like, stress. And um, No, it's great for marriage counselling. <laughs> God. Seriously, why go to marriage counselling when you can just go to a game, almost get killed by a monster, and have your fake pretend, like, real husband save you from that monster? I mean, well, yeah, nice. I mean... Who needs to talk it out after that? It's like, who else has ever saved me from, you know, a giant pair of teeth on legs? Really? Adrenaline doing the job that, uh, you know, 700 counselors could not. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear. It's a, it's certainly not our goal. Uh, what's, what's worth pointing out is that uh, the, the exercise in ramping up stress and tension levels also comes with a level of responsibility for you, the organizer, to take care of your players' mental health and well-being. Um, so there's sort of a like whoop, sliding scale there that if the, the level of intensity of the game moves towards, um, you know, high, then it's important that the level of care and attention that you pay to your players uh, go up as well. So um, thing tools like debrief um, and uh, mental health first aid training for your organizers. Um, and uh, did I mention debrief? Um, safe words and um, uh, other play control elements being available for your characters, uh, for your players, and also establishing a baseline of an important of a of a supportive and cooperative community do a, an awful lot towards ensuring that your players are, are well taken care of. So bearing in mind that like bleed is some pretty serious business. Um, some psychologists get very worried faces when I bring that idea up for LARP. Um, so it, it's important to recognize that you as an organizer have a lot, a lot of responsibility about your players' mental health care, um, particularly in intense games like that. Yeah. You can gain a lot out of those intense games. Um, I mean, there is a massive and thriving industry in designing tense situations so that teams can work their way out of them together, right? Um, and maybe we could get Jack on to talk about escape room design and that sort of thing at some point. But um, the, to me, part of the joy in games like Part of the value in games like Black Powder and Bloodlines that have the severe stress is the learning that I can deal with situations in which I'm put under severe stress. Like speaking as somebody who has had massive self-esteem issues and has had massive, um, you know, problems in speaking to people and, um, you know, being a decent person, like playing LARP characters has taught me a lot about who I can be as a person and who I can be as a human being and how to be those things, right? And if you design your game well, then your bleed can teach your players beautiful things about who they are. 
Yeah. Well, and again, going back to touch on a point, like if your game isn't sort of centrally designed around radicalizing players into um, Marxists, you're probably not building the right game and you should rethink your design from the ground up. Um, like political bleed is a vital part of, of game design. And yeah, I think it's important. Like you want every player to come away from your game feeling like Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg has sort of suffused their soul um, and that they need to destroy the apparatus of capital. And I think that's like a really important thing that players need to... Never change. Uh, never change, yeah. Aiden. Just, please um, never change. I'm, I'm Actually, streaming, all right? I have, I have a really serious point to make there, which is that everything is political and you need to remember that everything is political. And if you're not thinking about your political message, then you don't know what it is. But the political message of a standard prototypical D&D game is a pro-colonial, pro-feudal, pro-birthright uh, Well, pro-great man theory as well. Game. Yeah. It's like a core tenet of it's, fascism. It's a deeply authoritarian, deeply colonialist story. And standard fantasy games are. And so if you want if you don't support, I mean, if you support those, go for it. Those are the kind of games you could write, and they will help people think that. But or if don't, you, because that's trash. <laughs> if you don't, and you're a decent human being, then you should consider writing games that don't center colonialism as powerful and as the most important thing. And I think, see, I mean, I talk about colonialism a lot because I think that's the key problem with D&D. But also, greed is good. But also, um, you can write games like The Hobbit Toe Down, which is clearly communist propaganda, or you can write games like Black Powder and Bloodlines, which is anti colonialism at its deepest core. Um, but it explores that. It allows us yeah, to does. explore that. Yeah. Um, uh, that's another this panel. It's going to allow me to, <laughs> yeah. This is going to allow me to segue onto the uh, another slider, which is representation of theme. I how dare you? I I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my gym. Me too. I really need to go to bed. Do we yeah. want to do a part two of okay. this at some stage? I think we, we definitely... Oh, it's fine. Could, the mixing I'm, desk is a really simple concept. We can have it wrapped up by 9.30. Up. Ooh, are, we, are we showing cats? Is that what we're doing now? The cat, uh, uh, just we, we are still on stream. <laughs> Jess, do you want to wrap I've it up? I've got a really good one. I've got a really good one. <laughs> oh, look at it. uh, It's the grumpy one. <laughs> oh, kitty. <laughs> She's so mad. She's so mad. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Tonks is okay. Run away. Well, well, let me go ahead and just um, then, like, rattle off some other ones so that we can sort of, like, quickly wrap this up and then tie it in a bow and get out of here. Um, representation of theme, abstraction versus simulation. Um, you, How does your LARP uh, represent the reality of your setting? Is realism your goal? Um, and how how faithful are you going to be to the representation of the themes, especially within your genre? Like um, genres have a wide sweeping variety of um, sort of like cliches or tropes that they use um, with, within their genre. Um, and how much are you going to um, harness them uh, in, in your setting? So uh, Hobbit's Hoedown, uh, representation of theme it was mostly it was a party um, we wanted people to be very very lighthearted. Um, it was very very I think strong in its theme uh, even though there wasn't a whole lot of conflict or anything going on but all the tropes of the genre were still there um, Black Powder and Bloodlines, it has themes of colonialism um, that it explores. It has themes of uh, religion that it explores. Um, and, and of course, one of the themes is, is conflict. Um, uh, meta techniques, uh, intrusive versus, versus discrete. Um, it's a technique for, for giving information to um, players but not your characters. Um, I I don't have as much uh, experience with I this. I think that one's a very much a Nordic 
LARPing uh, are more relevant to Nordic LARPing. I haven't uh, seen any LARPs in Victoria which which use that sort of thing. But yeah, okay. Just, yeah. It, it's still worth mentioning. Um, player pressure, hardcore versus pretense, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. How... How much pressure are you going to put on your players? Um, Hobbit Hoedown has almost uh, zero uh, pressure on their players, um, except uh, making sure that you get there, that you've, you're clothed, um, and that you have brought whatever you're going to bring to the baking contest, Being yelled I at guess. my weird redhead to come and play cricket. <laughs> Um, and Black Powder on Bloodlines, I feel like it's a little bit more hardcore. Um, just a little, just a teeny bit more. It's basically a party, but you know, you might yeah. die. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and death is real, and and death is real. That means that uh, your your players are then um, they need to maybe have a, a backup character that they need to think of. Um, and uh, I think for, for Swordcraft, the, the player pressure, it's kind of like on a sliding scale, but you're never, you're never really, like, you're not going to die permanently. Um, and it's kind of like at the behest of the players of what they put on themselves because it is, it's such a sliding scale of, like... It is physically demanding, playing. though. It's the most stressed yes, I've ever been is. at a lot yes. has been at Swordcraft games. Like by also, a yeah, the, me too. the amount of stress on warband leaders is exponentially yeah. greater than the amount of stress on, playing yeah, a very on standard game. players. They play a different game. Um, I just wanted to mention with Black Powder, the stress might be that 30 odd people starve if you fuck up as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically like, so um, much stress. See, in that game. It's basically a party. Like yeah. if you brew your party, everyone the starts yes. Yeah. Um, there are definitely uh, other faders that could be part of the mixing desk, but these are some of the main ones. Um, you could definitely have like horror to comedy, um, uh, how cheesy or serious something is going to be, uh, player um, skill versus character skills. Um, that one's huge, yeah. It's really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, or how, how scripted something's going to be or how unscripted something is going to be. There are definitely many things that you could consider to be part of your framework. Um, it, but it's it's really kind of down to what kind of LARP you're trying to write and how you're going to um, communicate your story, how you're going to tell it. Um, and, like, as as Rob and, and Joe have um, usefully um, put into a succinct sentence um rules are the vehicle in which you you deliver your mixing desk ideals so um yeah i i guess is there anything else that anyone else wants to to add i think that's pretty good this this was a big topic and i did arrive late so my apologies for that as well <laughs> no that's all good What's um next? then the the, the the next uh, panel that we intend on running, if I just quickly bring it up, it is Ooh. mechanics. <laughs> so it's rules design versus role play. Um, what your aim should be in terms of rules and role play, and what questions you should be asking as a as a game designer, um, and perhaps maybe what questions will crop up once your players start playing the game um, because there's always going to be unintentional symptoms of, of your design that you'll you'll miss un, un, until you're kind of in the soup so um, yeah it'll be an interesting one and um, yeah I will we'll put it up um, once we've nailed down the next time we're going to to do a stream I believe we want to be able to do one on the on the weekend and probably towards the middle of the day, so that our um, our ADHD um, peeps are a little bit more uh, yes, medicated. Got my uh, <laughs> coursing through my veins. Yeah, that'd be good. 
Um, so thank you very much for all our viewers who've turned up. Yes. Thank you very much for our moderators who've been doing a glorious Yay. job in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and thank you everyone for, for tuning in and, um, and, and yeah, contributing to the discussion. I hope that this was useful and that it's helpful. And I, I know that it's like been fantastic to, to be able to, um, share ideas and, um, concepts with our peers like this. And it's, yeah, really, really, um, it's, it's really good for the brain juice, yeah, especially also, when you're, you're writing stuff. There should be a recording of this stream up soon. Um, Somewhere. So, yeah, it's been recorded. Should have it up on either Twitch or YouTube or both, if we can do both. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, um, thank you very thank much. You, to thank, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Hayden. Thank you, Mads. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, me. Thank, thank you, Des. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to all those people in chat following along and for all your Fs. Yeah. Thank you, chat. <laughs> we love you, chat. Thank you, VOD viewers, watching tomorrow yeah. or next mm -hmm. week. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And um, I guess there's uh, all that's left to say is goodbye. Yep. Good Bye. night. Bye. Goodbye. Sleep well. Bye. Wash Bye. your hands. Bye. Yeah. Be safe. <laughs> and ends.